All right, history fans, we're back with another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on the internet. All right, we are continuing on with Extra History series on the Haitian Revolution. We are on episode three. So if you have not watched the previous ones, check those out, come back and join us, and we continue. Um, series has been great so far, learn about the Haitian Revolution, which I've repeatedly been saying in these episodes so far. It's uh, uh, one of the most painfully overlooked revolutions of the modern era um and needs to be talked about more and uh, i think doing this hopefully will uh and i'm glad they're doing this but hopefully just get you a little more exposed to it and what it was able to achieve um, which was really unprecedented for the time and i'm excited to continue on with the series here so episode three is titled fire and freedom um, we, the, the kind of revolution is just kind of starting the first one, first episode kind of talked about kind of the, the, the environment, um, that the uh, revolution is kind of in response to with social differences. And then you start to see the lines kind of be drawn in, uh, the second episode. Now, I think you're going to start to see the, you know, the action, right? The action involved here. So, um, I'm excited to look forward to this. All right. Uh, it, make sure that if you like this video, go down to the description and go to the original video link over there. Give them a like and subscribe if you haven't yet. And if you haven't subbed to my channel yet, love to have you around, hit that uh, notification button as well. So you can hang out for our live events. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Fire and freedom. What do they got? August 22nd, 1791, North province, Saint Dumas. A dog barks, waking the plantation manager. He tells the mutt to quiet Doggo? down and drips back to sleep. Minutes later, always listen to your dog. Your dog has intuition. Okay, your dog has intuition, and uh, if he's barking, it's very likely that a revolution is about to begin. Right. <laughs> later, there's another noise. He rises and goes to the window, where he then sees that his house is surrounded exactly. <laughs> by the plantation slaves carrying machetes and torches. Who goes there? He calls. A voice like thunder answers. It is death. Oh, now, to, now you want to hear when you're sleepy eyed. Across the north, the cane fields burned so fierce that the smoke could be seen in La Cap. The revolt had come with such precise timing and explosive force that it stunned the plantation owners and the French authorities. Indeed, it was so well planned that most of the various factions in Saint Dumont thought that the enslaved couldn't possibly be the ringleaders, and they openly accused each other. <laughs> White They're like, wait, who's 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 orchestrating this? It couldn't be you lowly slaves. It's got to be other groups. Now remember, there's also infighting happening amongst the freed people in Haitian society, both the, uh, the um, they call the, the freed people of color and then the actual white French people. Um, and they also, they did not trust each other and uh, when they really should have unified because they have a lot of similar goals, but, but didn't. So this is, this is interesting. Attacked and killed several free people of color, who they accused of masterminding the rebellion as revenge for the death of OJ. Plantation owners besieged the royal governor with requests for protection and ultimately accused him of intentionally letting the rebellion continue. The free people of color often said that it was actually the big whites who'd whipped up the rising as a way to take control of the colony. The irony, of course, was that all of these groups all were pro-slavery. And if they had set their differences aside, they may have successfully repressed the uprising. This is what I was saying in those first two episodes, that I can't believe these two groups would not unify. And it's simply mostly because of the, 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 the race difference. They have similar economic status. Again, even these uh, free people of color own slaves, so they have far more in common than they do in difference. And now it's coming back to haunt them because now they're they're not going to be able to do anything about this. This the, the slave organization is so big now, they got no chance, it's, and it's probably too late for them to do anything. But instead, the plantations burned. Rebel militias moved from plantation to plantation, liberating the enslaved and burning every physical representation of their repression. Cane fields, coffee plants, mills, and refineries. This would have destroyed the economy there. Um, if, if, if they don't have the sugar cane and this stuff, this, this island, which again, remember, Haiti is the most profitable possession that the French Empire even has. And losing that would be terrible. This also yeah. meant violence against the people who had oppressed them. And there were a number of overseers and plantation owners killed in retribution for centuries of oppression. Gangs of women found the plantation overseers who had coerced or assaulted them, beating their tormentors unconscious. Ugh. But this rebellion was not indiscriminate. 
Most often, the rebels attacking a plantation had worked there, and it was common for men or women to step in and save an overseer thought to be a fair man, or to smuggle out women and children. In fact, the scene that started this episode comes from a first-hand account of the rebellion, and the reason that overseer lived to tell his story was that one of the rebels, a man who had been enslaved on that very plantation, stepped forward to demand the overseer's safety. Who was that man? Duddy Bookman, who had triggered the rising with his ceremony. Propaganda this guy was great. Of the um, look into him in the previous episode if you hadn't yet, for sure. Rising, sent back to France, claimed that thousands of white men, women, and children were killed in the initial rebellion. While this image is stuck, it's inaccurate. A commission at the time counted 400 whites dead in the first four months, including those killed trying to put down the uprising. The toll on the rebels ran much higher. Most of them were armed with only machetes and agricultural tools. Only one in five had a firearm. But they did have other advantages. Many had been sold into slavery as prisoners of war. Veterans of tribal conflicts who were adept at guerrilla warfare. Their raids, heralded with the blast of a conch shell, became infamous among their enemies. Even professional soldiers marveled at the rebels' bravery in the face of the superior firepower. Due to a belief that the spirits of those killed returned to Africa, they attacked with a relentless courage, literally throwing themselves on cannons, jamming their arms into barrels and wheel spokes so the guns could not be reloaded. <laughs> You're like, putting your yeah arm inside the cannon. Dude, that's crazy. These guys are going all out. This isn't a little thing. Or withdrawn. They suffered terrible casualties in pitched battles. 4,000 died in the August Rising alone, roughly 10 for every enemy killed. But they didn't lose morale. They did, however, start losing commanders. Bookman was killed in early November. Infighting claimed others. And as the first set of leaders... I wonder what they were infighting about. Why would you do that when you have such a, a, a clear common goal? ...fell, and factions splintered. The violence grew worse. Dang. All sides committed massacres. To approach Le Cap... What? Well, I, I do know that there was some discussion about the end of the revolution. The end of the revolution. That once it's over, what's going to be the future of Haiti, right? Um, people, you know, what what kind of nation should we be and stuff like that. And I wonder if that was part of what they would have had this infighting and factionalism with. One of the richest cities in the colony meant passing a wall of heads on stakes, including that of Bookman. But amidst the swelling chaos, new leaders rose. In the western province, near the city of Port-au-Prince, a separate uprising was happening among the free people of Col Um, I'm kind of wondering, too, because you got the island of Hispaniola here, right? And uh, on, you know, the closest side, or the, you know, further side over here, Santo Domingo, that's, that's Haiti today. And there's Santo Domingo, which today is the Dominican Republic, um, which was what... What is, what is happening on the eastern side of the island? in the Dominican Republic over here um, with this going on? Is it just completely ignored? Is it is it not involved at all? Um, because I know there's those maroon populations, those slaves that escaped and then went into the mountains to live, and I'm assuming maybe a lot of them went went over to the other side of the island, but in this part, what did what role did Santo Domingo play? I'm not really sure. Color. There. They managed to sign a treaty with many rural plantation owners, recognizing their shared interests as property and slave owners. They dismissed their all-white governments and installed representatives of both groups instead. After all, the National Assembly had made them free citizens with Remember the that? 15th decree. They were Remember, that's how so much of this started, was the fact that you had the, the, the French Revolution, you have a new constitution, Declaration of the Rights of Man, which proclaimed rights and protections for, for French citizens, and Haitians wanted that to apply to them, and that was their biggest thing, that it should apply to them, and they should have representation in the assembly and stuff like that, and that wasn't happening. So um, remember what this all kind of spawned from. We're only good revolutionary patriots following the law. Those big and small whites in Le Cap and Port-au-Prince they were the counter-revolutionary royalist traitors talking about independence. Except yeah. then a messenger came with the news that there had been a change in power, and the National Assembly had changed its mind. Yeah, the, the National Assembly changed. So the National Assembly came about, and they they went through, like, what is it, like three constitutions in, like, six years over in France that were constantly changing, having these new groups, the National Convention, and then the... Um, um, the directory, they had so many changes, so much instability in France. They just kept cycling through governments and constitutions that it was probably hard for the Haitians to even keep up on it. A 15th decree, making a small number of free people of color full citizens, had been repealed. The uh, plantation owner's rebellion had made like the that. assembly gun shy. 
worried that they'd upset an economy that was helped propping up French finances. This alliance with the whites was not to last. In November, after a long siege, the army of the free people of color finally entered the provincial capital of Port-au-Prince. Once inside, though, the treaty broke down as a personal brawl between one of the little whites and a free man of color <laughs> descended into street fighting that burned 27 square blocks of the city. The alliance was dead. This same thing will happen basically every time the whites and the free people of color try to form an alliance. Everything will be agreed between the plantation owning big whites and the free people of color, and then the small whites will come along and muck it up. And this is when one of the key figures of the revolution emerged a free black man named Toussaint Louverture. Now he's the he's the uh, the person that is the most famous and, and recalls. So this I'm starting to know a little bit more about with him, but um, I'm interested to know more about him, but he's kind of the key figure that, that comes out of the, the, the revolution. Um, kind of, yeah, the, the one that everyone knows, um, but there, it was obviously more um, complex than that. And you see it also, he's coming in later into the revolution, not at the onset of it. Louvatia's background, including any early involvement in the uprisings, is a bit mysterious. Yeah. He was born in slavery, but gained freedom long before 1791, staying to help manage the plantation where his family was still enslaved. He was also unusual in that he had no white ancestry, like most free people of color, and owned no property. Perhaps this fact, the sense that he was of two worlds, was why he was chosen to broker peace between hmm. the big whites and the black rebels. In this would make sense, because it doesn't look like he has this, this bias or whatever, or... Um, doesn't have one side pulling on him. He could be like a like a neutral party. Okay, I think that's important for this because a lot of revolutions you don't have that. You don't have somebody that can be seen as a mediator in the northern province. Because you see, by late November, it was a stalemate. The rebel army held much of the countryside, but the whites and government forces controlled the cities. In addition, a commission had just arrived from France with news that the country had a new constitution one that granted amnesty for actions committed during the initial revolution. Louvatia helped the rebel generals create terms, then carried them to the big whites, and get this, here are the terms that the generals of the rebellion offered. I... The enslaved would return to the plantations, and the generals would get freed. Yeah, you heard that right. The leaders go free, and everyone else goes back into slavery. See, here's another major theme to keep your finger on. Over and over again, we'll see the leaders of the Haitian Revolution make decisions that benefit themselves at the expense of the movement. Now it's unclear if the gen- <laughs> Oh, how corrupt is that? How corrupt is that? Generals could even have gotten their troops to accept these terms, but we'll never know. Because the big whites, once again, completely refused to compromise, rejecting even these terms. The only winner was Louverture, who gained major respect among the generals. In fact, he was soon one of them, a fellow general in the rebellion. And like many of the other generals, both of the rebels and the free people of color, he settled into living in a large house, giving orders in the little jigsaw piece of the north he controlled. And that's when Louverture began showing himself to be an exceptionally able statesman. Hmm. On the battlefield, he brought an organization and discipline to his forces that was previously missing in the rebel armies. And his political talents, too, were exceptional. He was excellent at striking compromise, bringing opposing sides together, and finding a situation all could live with. This seems like such a, um, with Louverture, like, for revolutions like this, I feel like you don't have these, these mediators like that. And maybe a lot of that's from the fact that sometimes the revolutionaries and the people they're revolting against have such different goals that there can seem to be no compromise at all, but... You don't see, yeah, many of these that can like, all right, let's let's compromise. Cause revolutions are usually what happen when compromise fails, right? I mean, while you're revolting because your compromises they they fail, and it's amazing that you that you have this here because you just don't hear about a lot of these. While the fighting was at a low ebb and in control of the countryside, the rebels went about creating a black society with black leaders, courts, and administrations which is incredible when you think that they had just been enslaved months before. But this was also a society headed by military officers, with peasants farming whatever land they could. To buy weapons from Spanish Santo Domingo, the generals often forced people to grow sugar on the old plantations, and, at times, even sold subordinates into slavery. A Jeez. practice Louverture refused to take part in, sure. because the revolution to this point was about better working conditions and more power, rather than abolitionism. Yeah, that that's something that's interesting too. Is um, wasn't it was it in the first episode they were talking about how they were going to make a deal 
Um, the, and even the, the the slaves almost were behind it that it wasn't even going to end slavery necessarily, but just change some of the conditions. Um, they would even stay in slavery. And of course, that was rejected by especially the big whites. Um, and I guess the I think the free people of color, too, that like this could potentially end with a compromise that doesn't even end with abolition of slavery. That's crazy, right? That that would even be something you could debate. But that would soon change because a ship was coming. On it were several commissioners from France carrying a newly signed law granting full civil and political rights to the free people of color in the colonies. Oh, that's right. The government had reversed itself again, going from <laughs> some free people of color having rights to none to then everyone all in about four months. But the commission also carried... The 1790s are such a disastrous mess for anything France is involved in. They can't... Comp they, they can't figure out anything. They're just like in the dark, throwing darts in the dark here. Um, they've toppled their monarchy, well, they're about to. Um, that was in 1793. Um, but, and they have no idea. It's like they, France has no idea what direction they're going, both home and abroad. It's almost like this revolution needs to, it's like, it, it, <laughs> Need something to revolt again because they don't even know what the future is going to be. It's a very unfair, uh, uh, unsure future. It orders to crush the white extremist dreams of independence, integrate the local assemblies, and end the slave insurrection. Okay. They came with 6,000 soldiers, but they would need more because within six months of the commission's arrival, other ships would be arriving in Saint Dumont, ships from Britain and Spain. France yeah. was at war. And the war in Saint Dumont was going international. Sure. So, well, it's, uh, special thanks to our educational tier patrons Ahmed Ziad Turk, Joseph Blaine, and Dominic Valenciana. So, one of the big features of the French Revolution was you had this infighting, right, in France, but then also France is fighting a coalition of nations, like Austria and Britain, Prussia, whatever, and you're now going to start to see that Haiti is going to be enveloped in this war, right? And I think that's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in the grander schemes is are, are France's enemies going to try to take advantage maybe of the instability that's created with the Haitian revolution back in, in, in Haiti um, and go after each other's colonies. I'm really interested in looking to see what uh, potentially what uh, role Napoleon might play later on um because he is going to be through the 1790s growing growing kind of through in, in in power there moving up kind of the ladder of of the military that's more towards the end of the decade though um but to see how this is going to continue to change directions because it kind of is in a way but it looks like there's no end in sight at this moment right this is because i don't it's like they don't even know what they're going for in a way all right well anyway uh that does it for this video I feel like I didn't add necessarily a ton. This was mostly me just absorbing all the, the story here. Um, but hopefully you're able to just kind of build um, in these episodes and start to see kind of the, the, the big picture of what's going on here. Um, so we're crossing uh, what is, is probably about the halfway point of this series. And I'm excited to, to keep going with that. So I don't know. Let, let me know what you think right now. What do you think of uh, Lever Tour um, as a, a key figure of this um, revolution? Uh, what do you what do you guys think of him um, so far here? All right. Well, again, if you like this video, go down below to the description. Um, give it a like uh, or go there. Give them a like and subscribe uh, subscription there. Definitely, if you um, have the means, join their Patreon. If you'd like to join our Patreon here, that'd be uh, great too. There's a link down below. You can check that out. One of the perks um, is you get to vote on videos that that get uh, highlighted, as well as you can get Discord um, some Discord features and benefits there and be a little tighter with our community that way. Um, also, if you haven't joined our Discord server, um, anybody can do that, and you can join us and get talking about this um, or any other history subject, or just come hang out with uh, fellow history fans out there, and that would be awesome. Thanks to everyone that's been supporting in any way. Thanks you for, uh, thank you for watching, and we'll go ahead and end it here. Um, look out for the next one, and we'll see you next time. Bye.